It's very, very, very easy life. And one of the charms of it for him is that it's uh, that he likes to be uh, around while human beings do whatever they do. You know, he just likes to attend their activities. When the students, you remember, when the students come, and they sit there, and he, he gets in between us, and the English language goes over him. And he likes that. I never worked until I was 25. Never had a job until I was 25. But I was urged to. I mean, my family was not comfortable about the idea of supporting me while I d read books, got a degree at Columbia, and then got a fellowship to go to Europe. And it was when I was 24 years old that I realized that I was not going to be staying in Europe more than yet another year. I was there for two and a half years or something the first time and then came home for family reasons. My mother was divorcing yet again and wanted me around to sort of help. So I went back to Cleveland, stayed there for another couple of years in Cleveland and in New York and moved to New York by 1956. And I realized that I didn't need to go to an office and that I could, careful, okay, that I could work at home translating and also have, if not time, occasion for writing my own things. And the first book of poems was written during that period up until 1963. It was published then and then they came fairly regularly after that every other year for about five years. Writing had nothing to do with my circumstances and everything to do with the discovery that I lived in books and that books were my, my, my companions and my, the thing that mattered. And I think that's where it all began. I was, I was, I was a little boy in a library and those were my friends. Books were the thing that I grew up with. I learned how to read when I was two years and nine months old. My grandmother taught me to read. I can still remember the moment when the certain words, I s saw them on the page as words. It was the first word I ever knew. And I didn't know what the word meant, but I, uh, I was told I was adopted. And I thought it was a noun, adopted, and a adopted. And I didn't know what adopted was, but I, I knew I was adopted. You, you follow me? Yeah. And, uh, uh, and gradually it be, was made clear to me, and that was uh, one of the things that I think was done very well by my mother and stepfather, um, was that uh, it was something that I always knew and sort of bragged about <laughs> to other people, and uh, didn't feel that in some way it was anything except a privilege, that I had been chosen and uh, was preferred. Living with my grandmother and being the child in the house was different. And I can remember her saying, perhaps sadly at one point or another, to my mother, uh, and in German, which she hoped I would not understand, er ist nicht wie die anderen. He's not like the others, my other cousins, she said. And, uh, I, and I didn't understand quite the tone of that whether she thought it was too bad that I wasn't like the others or that it was a real distinction and that maybe I was different for good reasons except perhaps not ones that I would understand. And so she would, there was an attempt to disguise what she had said from me, not, not successful. I can remember finding out what that meant, having to know. I was quite aware of it for me by the time, by the time I was nine. I mean, I knew I was homosexual, and I was quite aware of it, and knew even because I read a lot, sort of what that was, you know, and that was very helpful. And I could talk about it to my mother and stepfather and grandmother uh, rather well, and so that was that was settled. I'm not not at all ashamed of being learned or intellectual or whatever the word is that we like to use these days. Th those are, I'm quite comfortable about that. And that, that probably had 
something to do with not so much the way I was brought up as a as a rich boy or something like that or the ch the, the adopted son of rich parents, but um, uh, something to do with the school I went to, the progressive school called the Park School of Cleveland. It was a marvel. Um, uh, it was just uh, tiny, tiny classes, and uh, the whole notion of learning and of uh, inquiry into what learning was was done in such a way that uh, it really became it, it was a pleasure always dear mrs masters hi from the fifth grade class of park school we're here in new york city at the taft hotel you could have guessed that from the picture printed on this stationery i inked in x's to show you our rooms which are actually on the same floor as the Terminal Tower Observation Deck in Cleveland, which we visited on our fourth grade spring trip, but nowhere near so high as some skyscrapers in New York City. We've been up to the top of the Empire State and the Chrysler Buildings, which are really tall. Well, we took a subway train to the museum from the Taft Hotel. In fact, that was our very first excursion, but the noise, once we were on the platform, was so loud, one girl, Nancy Akers, cried. She was always chicken when someone told her that terrible roaring that the expresses made was Tyrannosaurus Rex himself, and she believed it. subway ride and we were coming to see the New York World's Fair and I was horrified by the noise. I was much too loud. I was real I mean I wasn't frightened but I was daunted by the noise. I thought you no one could could stand the, the noise. Maybe they were louder then. I don't know. But I, I thought of them as being extremely noisy and, and discouraging for that. And then when I I came to Columbia in 47 but gradually I learned to use the subways in New York the way everyone does, and it was much more satisfactory. I didn't notice the noise anymore. It was a nickel. I knew that my life would be uh, more likely to be fulfilled as a homosexual in a big city like New York rather than in Cleveland, Ohio, which is a big city, but not one in which it would be easy to live any kind of queer life. Where there were there were where there would be choices, you know, whereas New York offers choices in, in every realm, all the time. You must realize that most gay bars in New York at that time were still very severely policed. You had to stand facing the bar. And you couldn't turn around and talk to somebody with your back to the bar. Everybody had to face the same way as if you were really in the bar actually looking at your drinks and at the bartender. This is just conversation. I don't, I mean, nothing terrific was going on in, in there. I mean, there was no sex and there was not even any very heavy petting, but there was conversation and you, you couldn't just turn around and talk to somebody as if you were um, in, at home. The charade was that you were drinkers and, and that you were at a bar to have a drink. You could talk to somebody to your left and right, of course, but you, I mean, the whole idea of sort of moving away from that in most of these places. And eyes front, gentlemen. You called about a time, you must call when I'm there. Yes, I will. And all that. Are I you coming you to class? Yes, I am. Oh, good. See you upstairs. In class, we talk about American poets of the day. And uh, as you know, I don't teach workshop classes. I talk to the individual poets here tutorially. So that one part of it, they come here and we work one-on-one -on -one as often as they have new work. Sometimes once a week, sometimes once every two weeks, sometimes twice a week, depending on how much work they can bring and I can bear to, to deal with. And the crushing 
and that crushing inhuman machine, comma, the Parthenon, capital Parthenon. See if you can fuss with yeah. that, would you? Yeah. But that seems to me the right. That's a wonderful last line. Right. The only pussy he'll get is a bloody sock in the jaw. That's <laughs> really something. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's good. I think you should put, instead of P, just put toe there. Okay. Then you can leave in your okay, nail. Okay, good. Yeah. Ingrown nail, and it's hard to hit the line. Still, Coach is a preacher, and if you take religion, you'll see. By the way he sits in class, he's got nuts too big for him to give a shit about your toe. So drop them hits and hit the hips and hit that man square. Don't you know a second stringer only gets to wear his letter after graduation or on family vacations to Niagara Falls and other places where a kid can up himself in the you don't make starter then the only pussy you'll get is a bloody sock in the john i think you could if you, I, you, uh, if, uh, you ought to do something to because it's very strong that way whereas yeah. this is an anticlimax okay then it would be better all right i mean i'm speaking very um out of my range or depth or something <laughs> but i'm trying right. trying yeah and i'm you know that stuff is very far from me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to do it. That's painted by my friend David Alexander, and, and there's a kind of code of the fact that he painted it because the, um, the Donatello David is in the corner there, which of course I don't own, but I wrote a poem about the Donatello David, so that's sort of the connection. Oh, sometimes we'll say, you know, just friend or boyfriend, but it's usually quite clear from the way the introduction is made that we're a couple. I mean, we have some sort of joking ways that we think we ought to do it. Uh, the latest favorite being, um, I'd like you to meet my homosexual lover, Richard Howard. I was still living in Philadelphia at the time, and he was coming down maybe every other weekend, and I just kept it hidden. I was uh, working from photographs, and I had, you know, just taking photographs of Richard uh, all the time. Of course, one of the main elements is the, um, uh, based on a postcard of the Donatello David, which Rich Richard wrote a wonderful poem about. Um, the giant on giant killing. Well, the building across the street exists, although the scene that is allegedly going on, um, I invented. Uh, I've never personally witnessed anything like that, nor are there floral curtains in any of those apartments, but rather um, just hideous Venetian blinds. Um. I just found this Yates thing. Uh, the, I mean, I have it in, I, in my notes, and in my notebooks, I write it down all the time, but I, it is so, it is the, I think all happiness in life depends on having the energy to assume the mask of some other self. That all joyous and contented life is a rebirth as something not oneself. Something created in a moment and perpetually renewed in playing a game like that of a child where one loses the infinite pain of self-realization. And that, that seemed to me, that's the answer to the question. And it was so wonderful to, to hear it put so, so marvelously. Yeats was, of course, as great a prose writer as he was a poet. And you feel it in that, and the, 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 the conviction that swells up there when he, when he says happiness. All happiness in life depends on having the energy to assume the mask of some other self. What a thought, what a notion. And it's, many people would say that's just preposterous, that happiness in life would be being able to speak as oneself, you know. But there is this, I mean, I really recognize that as being the, the something that has moved me through now 30 or 40 years of writing and, 
um, where uh, it was very important for me to be able to speak as other people. I really believe in the poem on the page, and I, I have a certain feeling of discomfort when people come up to me and say, ah, you brought it all alive. You know, that you made it made it come off the page and it all seemed so, I don't like that. I, I, I want it to be on the page. Well, Mr. Auden, whom I used to know a little bit, and he was very kind to me. He was the person that was the head of the Pulitzer Committee the year that I was given a Pulitzer Prize, and he, because he was enthusiastic about something I did, we became friends. Knowing him certainly was not a change, but it was something um, that was a confirmation. It was a way of, of thinking, yes, I could, I could, you know, live like a poet. I mean, now, now that I see how this one lives and so forth. A lot of it, I certainly didn't want to live the way he did. I didn't want to be like him. And when I would visit him, I, I realized that there was a way of living with books and uh, uh, objects that I must never submit to, which was to have them all over the floor and so forth. And I re resolved never to let that happen to me. And, I'm, I'm, and so far, the resolve is kept, but it's with great difficulty. And I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not yet um, overcome by books, but as you see, they, they keep rising. Yes, he told me that. He said, my dear, you really should give up translating. You know, it's not good for you at all and very bad for your poetry. Carpentry. Think about carpentry, my dear. Well, that was ridiculous. By that time, I had been translating quite a, long, a lot and was in the, the thick of it. And I, it, I wasn't about to give up translating or to stop translating in order to be a woodworker. In America, there are many areas of uh, cowardice, uh, intellectual cowardice, that are difficult to master. In, if you're sitting in an airplane next to somebody and he turns to you and says, or she, uh, she in fact, and says, what do you do? Which is the, the, you know, the terrible American question, which is never asked, and you never can say to a stranger, what do you do in, in France, for instance. It, it would come up later, but it, it would not be asked in that way that Americans like to ask it. And I always, ex I never say I'm a poet, or I write poetry, or anything like that. I say I'm a teacher, or a translator or an editor sometimes. I mean, it depends what, what the circumstances are, but I find myself, I'm sorry, hello, hi. David. Um, where am I? Oh yes, cowardice, uh, about uh, the uh, inability to say, yes, I'm a poet. Sometimes I can say I write poetry, but everyone writes poetry, so that, that, doesn't, that isn't so bad. I I've talked about that in that one poem about I mean about Wild and Whitman and, and there is that expression in there about a life you've lived an essential life but I don't think it's something you want I I, I think you only want your own life and you want to realize it as uh, completely and um, expressively as you can. But I, I don't think it, you want it to be essential in the sense of the perception of the world that you have lived. What, what would one say about Miss Dickinson? We would have thought, most of us, and I certainly I as a boy, would have thought that this was an extraordinarily limited and circumscribed life and not in any way important. Or, and, and then what she did with it on, on the on the twelve acres, and uh, you know, and and her judgments when she said about the citizens of Amherst, they think I'm crazy, and I know they're stupid. We we have been fortunate. I really have enjoyed your visit. Oh, you must know. With you, I seem to hear myself speak as a stranger without recognizing myself. Only after you are gone shall I discover that it was 
I. Being alone is so important. You have to keep finding new ways, new tactics for doing it. Otherwise, you feel at home so quickly, which is to say, you are quite lost. No, no, I shall not say any more. My purpose henceforth will be to set words side by side in silence and watch, watch the words. Goodbye now. Go, go, go now. Leave me. Go. Yeah, no, that's very, that's very dear to me, that, that passage. That's something very, uh, very important. <laughs> that whole business about finding new ways to be alone and how quickly one loses the, the ways one had. I mean, the, they cease to be effective and you have to find new kinds of, I guess what, what would be called alienation. You have to invent ways to be not at home. Uh, but uh, even, I mean, being at, feeling at home is a, is a, is a sense of, of false security and, and all security is false, of course. And one has to be vulnerable. Five. Richard, we, we were here before. Don't you remember? I remember how the valley turned from umber to burnt sienna, how the clouds above sienna broke their Tuscan habit of harboring grudges. It came down that morning as if nothing would be held or held back again. Oh, but we were never there. And I remember the road to Rocamadour, turning round until it was ready to make a run for the hills, overhanging a chateau, caramel in the afternoon light. I remember how you took one hand from the wheel, and your new driving glove was the same caramel. You, you turned like the valley or like the road, and I remember your face then. But it never happened. And your face now, now we are here, and our hostess shows us to the same table we shared last time in Ye Waverly Inn. I forget your face. Last time is no more than lost, a series of revelations leading up to a full-length mirror. And only my fictions can free me from myself. Liberation is never complete while life lasts, and nothing afterwards.